All right, we're continuing along obstructive lung disease, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about aspirations, <clears throat> obstructive sleep apnea, and asthma. So aspiration, this is when there's the passage of food, uh, fluid, emesis, or other foreign material into the trachea, and then from the trachea into the bronchi, right, primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi, and then into the lungs. It's a common problem in young children or people laying down when they eat or drink, right? It's very possible that if you're laying down when you're drinking or eating, that it's not going to go down the esophagus, it's going to go into the windpipe. The result may be obstruction. That's if, there's asp if the aspirate is a solid object. The result may be inflammation and swelling if the aspirate is an irritating liquid, and the result may be a predisposition to pneumonia. Some of the potential complications, um, aspiration pneumonia, um, inflammation, the gas diffusion will become impaired, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, it may develop if inflammation is widespread, uh, pulmonary abscess, may develop if the microbes are in the aspirate, and then systemic effects when aspirated materials or the solvents are absorbed into the blood. Some of the clinical manifestations of an aspiration, coughing and choking with dyspnea, loss of voice if there's a total obstruction, there'll be strider and hoarseness. Um, it's the, well, if there is strider and hoarseness, that's the characteristic of an upper airway obstruction. Um, wheezing, if there's the aspiration of liquids. Uh, tachycardia and tachnia, so increased heart rate as well as increased uh, respiration. There'll be nasal flaring to try and increase airflow through the nose. The chest retractions you'll see between the ribs, how hard the intercostal muscles are working. And uh, hypoxia. Um, and the cardiac and respiratory arrest can also take place. With obstructive sleep apnea, this is the result of the pharyngeal tissue collapsing during sleep. And there's a moment in time where breathing actually stops. Um, this affects men more than women. It is commonly associated with obesity and aging. Those are the common predisposing factors. But it's also seen in type 2 diabetics. It's seen with cardiac heart failure, cerebral vascular accidents, erectile dysfunction, depression, and daytime sleepiness. What is the treatment for sleep apnea? Um, it, it's a CPAP device. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Pump. Um, it's an appliance that's designed to reduce the collapse of the pharyngeal tissue. So let me show you. Um, here, you can see when the person is lying down in sleep, the gravity and the muscles relaxing allow the tongue and all the surrounding tissues to fall back and obstruct the airflow. So air comes in through the nose, here's the hard palate, here's the soft palate with the uvula, and we start to get this obstruction. So they'll open up their mouth and try and get some more air in through this pathway, but the tongue pushes back, okay? And it's very difficult uh, to get air through that obstruction. So they'll use this device, the CPAP, which creates this even flow of air constantly pushing through there to try and keep this open, to keep the airway open. Okay, asthma. Let's look at asthma. Um, asthma is when there's periodic episodes of severe but reversible bronchial obstruction in people with hypersensitivity or hyperresponsive airways, and they get these repeated attacks. If there's repeated attacks, that can cause some permanent damage, and that's uh, what we call chronic asthma. Um, it may occur in childhood, or it can have an adult onset, and we'll always look for any type of familial history or any history of allergies. 
uh, allergies are involved with extrinsic asthma. This is when, uh, with, with extrinsic asthma, these are acute episodes triggered by type 1 hypersensitivity reactions to an inhaled antigen. Maybe hay fever, maybe an allergic rhinitis, maybe it's pets, right? Um, it's common in children and it may disappear in adolescence. So extrinsic asthma is acute episode triggered by what type of hypersensitivity reaction? A type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to an inhaled antigen. The intrinsic asthma, this is the onset during adulthood in comparison to childhood. It's, this one is hyper-responsive tissue in the airway that initiates the attack. It could be a respiratory infection, stress, an extreme shift to cold weather. Um, it happens with exercise. It's called exercise-induced asthma, and it can happen a reaction to certain drugs. With exercise-induced asthma or athletically-induced asthma, uh, believe it or not, I have found two things to be very helpful with many patients, and that is magnesium and coenzyme Q10. If you think about it, athletically induced asthma is triggered only when, yes, they're, they're being athletic, but if you think about the physiology, they're being athletic um, and their body needs energy production during those times. So it almost seems as if any time their body is trying to create ATP, it shuts down. So then I go to the mitochondrial dysfunction and we go to CoQ10, we go to uh, magnesium, and we go to some B vitamins to help with the mitochondrial resuscitation. I just have found uh, in many cases that to be extremely helpful um, in terms of helping with decreasing the incidence of them and also decreasing the longevity of when they have an attack. It's much, much less severe. So let's look at some of the pathophysiology, the changes of uh, the bronchi and the bronchioles. There's inflammation of the mucosa with edema, and that inflammation of the mucosa with the edema creates this bronchioconstriction, right? It decreases the space in the lumen for air to flow. The bronchioconstriction um, or the decreased lumen space is also created by that smooth muscle contraction. So you've got inflammation of the mucosa with edema. You have bronchial constriction. You have increased secretion of the thick mucus. And that's going to create this wheezing sound when they, every time they breathe in, you're going to hear this wheezing. That type of sound. Um, there's going to be cough, marked dyspnea this tight feeling in their chest, wheezing, rapid or labored breathing. Uh, they'll try and, uh, when they cough, they'll try and expel the thick or any type of sticky mucus. Their heart rate is going to be faster, so they'll have tachycardia. And then they'll have uh, a condition called pulsus paradoxus, where the pulse actually changes and it differs on inspiration and expiration, okay? Uh, and they have hypoxia. With uh, asthma, there could be respiratory failure, uh, indicative by decreasing responsiveness, and bluing, bluing of the lips, bluing of the fingertips, even bluing of the ears, that's uh, cyanosis. Um, status asthmaticus, this is when there's persistent, severe attacks of asthma. Uh, they don't typically respond to the usual therapy. That is a medical emergency because this could be fatal uh, due to the severe lack of oxygen or hypoxia as well as the metabolic acidosis. So here you can see um, the edema of the mucous membrane. So this is all swelling. There's mucus. There's a mucus plug that's forming. You have the smooth muscle around the uh, trachea and those can constrict, creating bronchiospasms. And then you have an obstructed bronchio. And when air is trying to pass through here, uh, you'll get that wheezing. The general measures for this um, in terms of treatment, um, 
they'll do skin tests for allergic reactions to try and eliminate the uh, the aggravating allergens. Um, and when they do trigger and find out what it is that's creating a reaction, uh, you'll avoid those triggering factors. A good ventilation of the environment is important. Swimming is very helpful. Walking and the use of inhalers, uh, these, these dilators, um, to open up the bronchi to increase the oxygen flow. Um, measures for acute attacks, there's controlled breathing techniques that are taught, uh, bronchiodilators, and even glucocorticoids as anti-inflammatories. Uh, prophylaxis and treatment for the chronic asthma, the leukotriene receptor antagonists. Remember, the leukotrienes are involved in the bronchioconstriction, so they block the inflammatory response. Remember when you had the, um, the arachidonic acid, um, you can get prostaglandins from that. You can go the COX pathway and get prostaglandins, or you can go the LOX pathway and get the leukotrienes. So uh, the leukotriene receptor antagonists, or those blockers, will block the inflammatory response. It's not effective for acute attacks, uh, just for the, the chronic asthma. And then chromalin sodium, that's a prophylactic medication. Um, inhalation on a daily basis, it's used for athletes and sport enthusiasts. Again, it's no value during acute attack. Um, just more for the uh, chronic and prophylactically, but not during an acute, medic uh, an acute attack. And then uh, finally, I wanted to show when there are, um, when there is asthma to the lungs, there could be a neurological factor. Um, so when we look at the nervous system as a potential target for asthma, we have to look once again at that vagus nerve. And that vagal nerve, the nuclei, is in the medulla oblongata that's protected by C1 and C2. So looking to see if the parasympathetic nervous system, if there's any type of autonomic nervous system imbalance, um, it can have symptoms in the lungs, in the stomach, in the pancreas, in the liver, in the kidneys, the bladder, and the reproductive organs. So um, I like to use spirometry just to kind of uh, assess uh, lung volume. And I'll do a treatment here at the C1, C2. I, I like to use uh, surface EMG um, to measure imbalances uh, to uh, anywhere at different levels of the spinal cord, but especially at the upper cervical region. And then I do pre and post scans on my patients after we make a correction to the C1, C2 area. And again, between the neurological approach and looking at um, even symptomatic uh, using magnesium, CoQ10, B1, B2, B3, uh, between a structural approach, a chemical approach, and a neurological approach, uh, we can manage this very, very well. Um, if the medications aren't uh, serving the purpose or if the family wants more of a holistic uh, approach. So this illustration shows the parasympathetics. Remember, the parasympathetics are cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10. So you have 3, 7, 9, 10, and you also have the sacral segments S2, 3, and 4. The cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10 both originate in the medulla oblongata, which is why assessing the integrity of the C1, C2 articulation could create subluxation complex or interference to the brainstem. Okay, when we return, we'll look at uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, sometimes called a cold chronic obstructive lung disease. We'll talk about emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and bronchiectasis.